This video is made possible by Brilliant. You're going to learn more about Brilliant later in today's video. But if you'd like to learn more about them right now, go to brilliant.org forward slash biographics. You'll also find a link in the description below. Leon Trotsky was a man of thought and action. His dream of a utopian society built on Marxism, it crumbled around him, yet he never gave up on his ideals. When he was sidelined by the power-hungry Joseph Stalin, he wielded his pen to expose the despot to the world, knowing full well that in doing so, he was signing his own death warrant. In today's biographics, we discover the man who was Leon Trotsky. The man who is known to history as Leon Trotsky was born Lev Davidovich Bronstein on November 7, 1879. His parents, David and Anna, were farmers in the Ukrainian village of Yankova. David had built himself up from nothing to become one of the most successful farmers in the entire region. Lev was the fifth child born to the Bronsteins. During his first eight years, he was kept on the farm and instructed by his parents. The language they spoke was a mixture of Russian and Ukrainian. Then, at the age of eight, he was sent to a private Ukrainian Jewish school in Odessa in Ukraine. Lev struggled during his first year at school as he was not familiar with the vernacular of Jewish Yiddish that was spoken. In time, though, he improved, and he proved himself to be a very capable student. He quickly learned to speak Russian, and he fell in love with Russian literature. After two years at the private school, Lev was trans transferred to a state-run Russian school. At St. Paul's High School, he excelled to be one of the top students. However, he proved to be an independent thinker, which sometimes led to run-ins with his teachers. His reading of such intellectual giants like Leo Tolstoy gave him the knowledge to challenge things that the other students accepted about the order of society, which caused frustration for his long-suffering instructors. Graduating from school at the age of 17, Lev moved to the Ukrainian port town of Nikolaev, close to the Black Sea. He lived with two relatives while he decided what he wanted to do with his life. Nikolaev at that time was a center of revolutionary dissent, and the teenage Lev soon began to mingle with the radical crowd. Within a few months of arriving in Nikolaev, Lev met a young woman by the name of Alexandra Sokolovskaya. She was six years older than Lev and well versed in revolutionary leftist politics. Lev later recalled that he was attracted to Alexandra because she was the only person who was able to defeat him in a debate. The subject at issue was Marxism and whether it would be the best thing for Russian society. Lev argued against it, but every argument that he made was deftly destroyed by the wit and the wisdom of Alexandra. Lev he found himself falling in love with her, but hardly before the relationship could get established, he was thrown in jail. The cause of his imprisonment in January of 1898 was his involvement in a demonstration of striking union members. Over the next two years, he was regularly thrown in jail for short spells as a result of his involvement in public demonstrations. In 1900, Lev and Alexandra they were married. Shortly after the wedding, Alexandra was banished to Siberia for four years as a result of her own radical activities. Her new husband, though, he went right along with her. They ended up in the Siberian village of Ustkut. Over the next two years, they eked out a living in this cold and harsh terrain. The couple also had two children, girls named Zineda and Nina. After two years of this exile, Lev had already had enough, and he was ready to make his escape. By now, his wife had fully converted him to Marxism communism, and he was determined to get out of this purgatory and become active in the revolutionary cause. It was resolved that Alexandra would remain in Siberia with the two young children. Lev traveled to the Irkutsk region of Siberia. There, he got a hold of a stolen passport. It was then that he assumed his new name, scribbling it on the pages of the fake passport, Leon Trotsky. He made his way to London, eager to learn at the feet of the founder of Russian Marxism, Vladimir Lenin. The two men developed an immediate bond. Lenin took Trotsky on as his apprentice, setting him to work as a writer for his communist newspaper, Iskra. Within a couple of months of his arrival, Lenin sent him out on a fundraising and publicity tour of Europe to promote the newspaper as well as the communist cause. On the Paris leg of the tour, he met a young woman by the name of Natalia Sedova. Despite still being married to Alexandra, he and Natalia soon became man and wife. She returned with him to London and 
they set up house there. Not long after his return from Europe, Trotsky attended the Second Congress of the Democratic Workers' Party in London. The main topic of discussion was the recent split in the Russian Communist Party between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. The Mensheviks were the more moderate of the two factions, who envisioned a gradual transition to communism. The Bolsheviks, however, they were far more radical. They intended to dismantle the current system immediately and replace it with full-on communism. They were fully prepared to stage violent uprising in order to achieve their means. The names of these factions, they tell us about their levels of support. The Menshevik means men of the minority, while Bolsheviks translates to men of the majority. Lenin was in favor of the Bolsheviks. At the Congress meeting, he explained that the Bolsheviks needed to create a centralized power structure from which they could control and direct the common people. This idea it was very troubling to Trotsky, who saw it as a replacement of the type of capitalist control of the masses that they were trying to get rid of. For many years after that, he continued to try and bridge the divide between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. In 1905, Russia suffered a humiliating defeat against the Japanese in the Battle of Tsushima. It left the Russian economy in ruins and led to mass demonstrations. On January 22, 1905, a peaceful demonstration gathered outside of Tsar Nicholas's Winter Palace. Nicholas reacted by sending in the cavalry. The demonstrators were routed, with hundreds being killed in the street. The people, they were outraged. In the Bolshevik ranks, however, celebrations began to occur. They saw this as the spark that would bring on the Great Communist Revolution. Over the following months, protests grew larger, morphing into the general strike of October 1905. Over that period of time, the Bolsheviks they were busy organizing the resistance. Both Lenin and Trotsky had relocated to St. Petersburg. Trotsky began organizing special workers' assemblies. These groups were designed to take control of regions that were to be governed by a workers' council. The Russian word for council? Well, that would be Soviet. Trotsky set up the first Soviet in St. Petersburg, with him serving as its chairman. In short order, the region was surrounded by the Tsarist army, and Trotsky was taken into captivity. He was held in prison for nearly a year before being put on trial. Defending the charge of leading the armed rebellion, Trotsky gave an impressive speech in which he laid out all the benefits of Marxism. All of this was in vain, however, as he was convicted, and he was exiled once again to Siberia. <laughs> Trotsky determined that there was no way that he was going back to that Siberian wilderness. In January of 1907, he escaped while being transported to his place of banishment. For a second time, he headed off to London. Within weeks, though, he had relocated to Vienna in Austria. It was there that he started working for the communist propaganda newspaper Pravda. Financing the ongoing publication of Pravda was a constant challenge. In 1909, Trotsky requested that the Bolshevik Central Committee inject funds to keep the paper going. Lenin, now at the head of the Bolsheviks, agreed, but only on the condition that a Bolshevik be put in place as assistant editor. This meant that the moderate views which Trotsky had managed to infuse into the paper were no longer going to be acceptable. From 1910 onwards, Pravda became the mouthpiece of Bolshevik communism. Tensions between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks they continued to cause division. In 1912, Lenin instigated a purge to remove the moderate voices. Trotsky remained in opposition to the more radical actions of the Bolsheviks, such as armed robberies of banks to finance the party. He organized a unification conference to bring the factions together, but it was a failure. Throughout 1912, Trotsky wrote for a number of radical Russian and Ukrainian newspapers. In September of that year, he was sent on assignment to cover the Balkan War. When World War I broke out, he moved from Austria to Switzerland and then to Paris. From his base there, he wrote anti-war diatribes in which he described the injustice of the workers of the world who were being forced to kill each other at the beckoning of their rulers. The French government they were not impressed with this anti-war stance, and they had Trotsky deported on March 31, 1916. Trotsky, he went to Spain, but his writings led to deportation from that country as well. He ultimately ended up in the United States. He arrived in New York on January 13, 1917. He settled into a small room in the Bronx and began writing for several Russian newspapers. A month after his arrival in the US, Trotsky received the news that Tsar Nicholas had been overthrown. He decided to return in order to play his part in the history that was unfolding. On March 27, 1917, Trotsky sailed from New York Harbor on board the SS Christiana Fort. However, the ship was intercepted by the British Navy at Halifax, Nova Scotia, and Trotsky was held in an internment camp for a month. Through the intervention of the Russian foreign minister, he was released and he was able to continue on to Russia. 
Now, just before we get into the very important October Revolution, I do want to tell you a bit about Brilliant. Brilliant are a science learning platform that allow you to learn through active learning. Basically, summed up, this is the opposite of that feeling where you read a really complex paragraph about some principle and then you've just got no clue what on earth is going on. Even if you've read it through 10 times, you're still like, huh? Anyway, and Brilliant don't just teach you the basics, although they do cover that as well. They go all the way to complex things like differential equations. Now, you've heard me talk a bunch about Brilliant previously if you're a regular viewer, and I think they're a perfect fit for this channel because, hey, you're probably into learning and education because you're on YouTube and you're watching a 20-minute educational video. So you're into learning, you're into this channel, you'll probably be into Brilliant too. Recently, Brilliant made an important update to their mobile app so that now courses can be accessed offline, so you don't have to worry about having a solid internet connection to learn things through their platform. Maybe this means you can spend your commute learning something, or indeed you can learn something wherever you want. Brilliant makes even complex concepts easy to understand. They give you something super short to read, it's really easy, and then you immediately apply it to a problem, rinse and repeat, and suddenly you're understanding all sorts of stuff that you didn't think you'd ever get. All courses are totally interactive, so you can learn probability by playing blackjack, or you can learn the physics of motion using interactive models of pendulum clocks. So, if you want to support biographics, which would be awesome, and get unlimited access to all of Brilliant's in depth depth math and science courses, you can head over to brilliant.org forward slash biographics and get 20% off their annual premium subscription. And let's get back to Trotsky and his revolution. Following the ousting of Tsar Nicholas, a supposedly neutral provisional government was put into place until a more permanent government could be established. Trotsky arrived in St. Petersburg on May 17, 1917. He soon became a popular speaker at town halls and factories as the various political elements vied for power. His catchphrase embodied the three tenets of his revolutionary vision. Distrust the bourgeoisie, control our own leaders, and have confidence in our revolutionary forces. The Bolsheviks, they struggled for more radical changes than the state government or Duma envisioned. Trotsky aligned himself with the Bolsheviks. He was arrested on August the 7th for his involvement in a Bolshevik demonstration. He spent 40 days in prison. He's probably used to that at this point. On October the 8th, with the Bolshevik support gaining ascendancy, Trotsky was voted governor of the St. Petersburg Soviet for a second time. By the end of the year, the provisional government, it had failed. It was superseded by the Bolsheviks with Lenin at their head. The second most powerful man? Well, that was Leon Trotsky. An immediate focus for the Bolshevik government was to get Russia out of the war. This task was handed to Trotsky along with the title of People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs. On December 2, 1917, the Bolsheviks signed a ceasefire with the Allied Central Powers of Germany, Austria-Hungary and Turkey. Talks then began between Trotsky and the Central Power delegates to work out an armistice agreement. The Germans in particular, they drove a hard bargain. They demanded that the Russians give up their claim to Ukraine, Poland, Lithuania, as well as parts of Latvia and Belarusia. Trotsky was taken aback by the demands, but he also knew that he had little choice. The Bolsheviks had campaigned on a platform of getting Russia out of the war, and all of Russia was essentially demanding that. Trotsky he related the demands to Lenin, adding that he felt they had no choice but to agree. Lenin he was of the same opinion. But when the rest of the Bolshevik government heard the demands, they were infuriated. They managed to convince both Trotsky and Lenin not to sign the armistice. In the end, Trotsky simply decided to pull out of the hostilities without the benefit of an armistice agreement. He explains, We declare we end the war but will not sign a peace. They will be unable to make an offensive against us. If they attack us, our position will be no worse than now. It was a gamble that Trotsky would immediately regret. On February 18, 1918, Austrian and German forces they invaded Russia. They found the borders completely undefended. On hearing the news, Trotsky he was dumbfounded. He sent a message to the German ambassador stating, We request clarification of this misunderstanding. But there was no misunderstanding. The very next day, Trotsky was commanded by Lenin to accept the original German conditions for the armistice. With Russia now out of the war, Trotsky was made commander-in-chief of the Russian armed forces. A crisis occurred when the Czechoslovak legions returning from the war revolted against the Bolshevik government. The resistance grew into what became known as the White Army. When he heard that the outpost of Kazan had fallen to this opposition, Trotsky hopped on a train and headed for the area to assess the situation for himself. His train only made it part of the way before he was forced to turn back. 
But before they could get out of town, the White Army forces that surrounded Trotsky's contingent. For 25 days, they were forced to fend off the assault until they were finally able to break out and return to St. Petersburg. With the White Army challenging them from the east, the Bolsheviks also faced pressure from the north as a Finnish group known as the White Guard sought to rescue Tsar Nicholas and his family from captivity. The group were on the verge of taking control of the town of Yekaterinburg, which is where the royal family were being held captive. Then the order came through to kill the entire royal family. With this terrible deed done, the Bolsheviks were ousted from the town. However, the White Guard, they were simply too late to save Nicholas or his family. At the beginning of 1919, Russia it was in a state of crisis. Civil wars had racked the country, and now disease, famine, and poverty decimated the population. Meanwhile, European powers hovered around like vultures ready to devour the Russian corpse. By October, the White Army had almost total control and were pressing at the gates of St. Petersburg. The Soviet government ordered a full-scale retreat from the capital, but Trotsky he strongly disagreed. He rallied his supporters to resist to the very last man. Trotsky's bravery, persistence, and strong personality turned the tide. The Soviet forces dug in and managed to push back the White Army. St. Petersburg was safe, and the tide of the Civil War it began to change in favor of the Bolsheviks. By the end of 1920, the White Army had been concentrated in Siberia. The Soviets had survived to see off their enemies and cement their leadership. However, in May of 1922, their leader and visionary, Vladimir Lenin, hit a massive stroke. Trotsky would have seemed to have been the natural successor. However, there was another member of the Bolshevik power structure who had other ideas, and his name, of course, was Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin was a street fighter and a thug who had cajoled his way into becoming the General Secretary of the Soviet Union by the time that Lenin died. The position it didn't hold any real power, with all of his actions being controlled by the Executive Committee or the Politburo. By the end of 1922, Lenin had recovered sufficiently to send a note to the Politburo giving his thoughts on his successor. He stated that Trotsky was a stronger personality than Stalin, but that he was too prone to acting unilaterally without consulting the rest of the council. As for Stalin, he considered him to be too rude, too ruthless, and too intolerant. Lenin held on until January 21, 1924. During that time, it became clear to Stalin that the dying leader favored Trotsky over him. This led him to embark on a ruthless campaign to discredit Trotsky. He claimed that Trotsky was trying to cause divisions within the party by trying to push out the old guards in favor of younger members who were more inclined to his will. Stalin managed to have a book that Trotsky had written in 1923 banned from sale as being anti-Leninist, even though it was nothing of the sort. The open and constant criticisms of Trotsky resulted in the loss of his two officers as chairman of the War Council and People's Commissar of War and Navy. After spending almost all of 1925 without a job, Trotsky was recalled in 1926 and given three roles. However, Stalin interfered so much that he resigned from two of them, only retaining the position of chairman of the Concessions Committee. But Stalin was not through with Trotsky yet. On November 12, 1927, he had him expelled from the Communist Party and then exiled to Kazakhstan. Three months later, he was completely banned from living in the Soviet Union. Soviet guards they forced him onto a train and would not tell him where he was going. After going on a hunger strike, he was finally informed that he was headed for Turkey. This enraged Trotsky, who was convinced that the anti-communist regime there would have him executed immediately. He sent a message to the Central Committee requesting a change of heart, but there was no response. Surprisingly, though, the Turks they treated Trotsky with the greatest respect. He was given a home to live in with his wife Natalia and their son Lev. From his new base, he began writing about the situation within the Soviet Union and specifically the failings of Stalin. He didn't hold back, writing the following in an article titled, What is Stalin? His political horizon is extremely narrow. He has the mentality of a dogged empiricist, devoid of creative imagination. These writings were published in newspapers around the world. Knowing what we do now about Stalin's personality, it is a wonder that he didn't have Trotsky killed immediately. But to have done so would have been to bring the condemnation of the world down on Stalin. As a result, he sought to shut him up by sending him deeper into exile. The Turks received orders to remove Trotsky to the island of Principo. After a year there, he managed to get political asylum in France. The French would not allow Trotsky to live in Paris, so he settled in the coastal community of Rayon. He spent almost two years there, but then French-Soviet relations improved and the government was pressured to deport him. For a year, he stayed in Norway with journalist Konrad Knussen. While there, he wrote The Revolution 
Constitution betrayed, which further highlighted the failings of Joseph Stalin. A furious Stalin pressured the Norwegian government, and Trotsky was, once again, deported. He and his wife and son they now headed for Trotsky's final destination of Mexico. For just over two years, from January 1937 to April of 1939, they lived with artists Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. During that time, Trotsky had an affair with Frida, even though his wife and son were also living under the same roof. In April of 1939, the Trotskys moved into their own home a few streets away from Diego and Frida. It was here that he wrote his strongest attack on Stalin yet. The article was titled Hitler and Stalin. In it, he wrote about Stalin's hypocrisy in signing a non-aggression pact with Hitler. It stated, Over the last three years, Stalin has labeled every one of Lenin's comrades in arms agents of Hitler. Having destroyed the army party and decapitated the army, Stalin is now openly advancing his candidature as Hitler's chief agent. By now, Trotsky was convinced that Stalin would soon silence him. On February 27, 1940, he wrote Trotsky's Testament, in which he defended himself as a loyal party member. In the mid-1940s, Trotsky's house was swarmed by members of the Russian secret police, the NKVD. Trotsky's guards managed to fight them off, though. Following the failed assassination attempt, Trotsky wrote an article titled Stalin Seeks My Death on June 8, 1940, in which he stated that another assassination attempt was absolutely certain. A month later, on August 20, 1940, a man walked into Trotsky's study and buried an ice pick into his head. Trotsky did not die immediately, though. Rather, he fought the attacker until his bodyguards were able to come in and subdue him. Trotsky was rushed to the local hospital. According to James P. Cannon, the secretary of the Socialist Workers' Party in the USA, Trotsky's last words were, I will not survive this attack. Stalin has finally accomplished the task he attempted unsuccessfully before. He died the next day. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below. And don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this several days a week. So hit that subscribe button to find out about those. If you're looking for something else from me, I've got another channel called Top Tens. You will find that linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.